Oh, it is four. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, um, so I, it is four o'clock, and so we're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Jennifer Summers. I am the Program Development Specialist with the Wisconsin Center for Wildlife, and we are hosting this uh, seminar series, which is titled History, Successes, and Challenges in Natural Resources Decision Making. Um, today, you are here um, to hear uh, our, our guest speaker, Tony Blattler, who is the chairman of the Wisconsin Conservation Congress. But before we get going and before we introduce our speaker, I would like to take a moment to go through a couple of acknowledgments. Um, first of all, I would like to say thank you to everybody in the Wisconsin Center for Wildlife, including our student employees and uh, our director, Scott Hingstrom, who uh, helped pull this whole seminar series together. And I'd like to say thank you to him and to all of our students for their assistance with, uh, with uh, facilitating these events. And UW, or, I'm sorry, uh, Wisconsin Center for Wildlife is an extension organization. We're part of the, um, because we have uh, our, Scott Hingstrom is an extension uh, professional. Um, everything that we do is, is geared towards uh, extension and bringing wildlife science out to the public and to professionals and landowners and students alike. So I'd like to thank those organizations for their assistance. And also, of course, your, uh, thank you to the College of Natural Resources. Uh, this is uh, ultimately their seminar too. And so we'd like to thank their, them for their assistance in making this happen. And of course, we always like to acknowledge um, the, the history of this site. We recognize the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point occupies lands of the Ho-Chunk and Menominee people. Please take a moment to acknowledge and honor the ancestral Ho-Chunk and Menominee land and the sacred land of all indigenous peoples. Finally, I'd like to put, uh, have a little save the date here. This is the third seminar today in our seminar series. Uh, we have four more coming up. Uh, our next week is going to feature Christine Thomas, our very own College of Natural Resources Dean Emerita and Professor Emerita. And she is going to be talking about public involvement in the uh, natural resources de decision making process. And then, of course, we have uh, Dan Bauman coming up, who is the Secretary's Director for the WDNR. And so please mark your calendars, take a look at these dates, and please join us for these future, uh, for these future presentations. I have some other interesting ones coming up as well. Um, but now I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to Jessica Tomaszewski, who is going to introduce our speaker today. Yep. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, my name is Jessica Tomaszewski. I am an outreach uh, program manager with the Wisconsin Forestry Center. And it is my honor to introduce uh, Tony Blattler. Um, who is currently the chair of the Wisconsin Conservation Congress. Uh, Tony uh, grew up in Marshfield, just a little bit away from here, um, and grew up going up to northern Wisconsin on the south fork of the Flambeau River, where the Elk River conjoins, um, and doing all kinds of hunting and fishing as a young man, and then um, married his high school sweetheart and had three great daughters. <laughs> and <laughs> The joke is I'm one of them. <laughs> uh, and um, in 2000, he became a delegate for Portage County in the Wisconsin Conservation Congress and has been active on the Congress since then. Uh, when moving up to um, Price County, uh, he became a delegate up there and then uh, moved into district leadership uh, up in District 1, uh, the Rules and Regulations Committee, and helped us streamline some processes. Uh, and is now currently the chair of Wisconsin Conservation Congress. So it is my great pleasure to welcome Tony, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well this, this, this is going to be as laid back as you want it to be. So if at any point you have any questions or whatever, don't hesitate. Um, I'm going to refer to my notes just to, I, I'm one of these people that if I start talking and don't stick to structure, we could be here till dawn. So uh, we're going to try not to do that. So as, as my daughter Jessica said, uh, I've been on the Congress for 20 years. Um, how many of you are born and raised in Wisconsin? OK. Hey, you've heard of the Conservation Congress? OK. Good. All right. That's, that's, a, that's a good start then. Uh, those of you that aren't from Wisconsin, this might be a little bit of a a different spin, maybe you haven't heard of us, maybe you haven't attended our meetings. Typically, when I first started on the Congress, uh, Ben Franklin School, the junior high, is where we always had our annual spring hearing. And there were always, always 40, 50, sometimes 75 or 100 UWSP students there. So I'm very familiar with how, how it works with you guys and, 
and uh, some of the things that you bring to the table. I hate this math. Absolutely hate it. So the Wisconsin Conservation Congress is the only statutory body in the state where citizens elect delegates to advise the Natural Resources Board and the Department of Natural Resources on how to responsibly manage Wisconsin's natural resources for present and future generations. The Congress accomplishes this through open, impartial, broad-ranged actions. So that the, 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 the fact that we're a statutory body is important because unlike, say, Ducks Unlimited or Isaac Walton League here in, in, in the area, those are conservation organizations. They're active organizations. They don't necessarily have some of the same Oh, rules that we have to follow sometimes with, with, with Wisconsin laws and some of the rest of it. Plus, they might be more singly focused on local resource uh, issues, whereas the Conservation Congress and the way we're set up, we try, try and cover as much of the state as we can. The vision of the Wisconsin Conservation Congress is to strengthen and enhance our ability to gather and convey the wisdom and influence of Wisconsin citizens in the formation of natural resource policy, research, education, and conservation. Our purpose is to provide an avenue for public input and exchange of ideas concerning conservation issues. So we're very proud of the fact that Wisconsin and the Conservation Congress has a very unique system of, of taking and providing citizen input when it comes to natural resource management. Uh, there are other, other things that other states do. They might have a series of public hearings. They might have uh, uh, individual email type uh, reach outs and the rest of it. But we have a statutory organized system since 1934 for how we gather input from citizens. In the final analysis, no matter what the commission Commission is what things used to be called in 1934. I'll give you a little hint there. In the final analysis, no matter what the commission or the department believes to be in the best interest of the state, if the citizenry are not in accord, any program set up would eventually be doomed to failure. The birds, animals, and fish belong to the people of the state of Wisconsin. And that's written right in the Constitution. So we're, we're all about grassroots public input. Uh, as far as our history, in 1934, UW Professor Aldo Leopold, Chief Warden Harley McKenzie, and Superintendent of Game William Grimmer designed the county-based system of citizen involvement we know as the Wisconsin Conservation Congress, formally created by the Wisconsin Conservation Commission. So again, some more changes in, 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 uh, in uh, titles. In 1972, Pat, uh, Governor Patrick Lucy signed legislations that legally formed the Wisconsin Conservation Congress, and this is what we formed. Statute 15.348, the Wisconsin, or the Conservation Congress shall be an, an independent organization of citizens, we're all volunteers, of the state and shall serve in an advisory capacity to the Natural Resources Board on all matters under the jurisdiction of the board. Its records, budgets, studies, and surveys shall be kept and established in conjunction with the Department of Natural Resources. Its reports shall be an independent advisory opinion of such Congress. So a couple of key points. A, we're statutory, okay? That, that, that puts different spins on some of the stuff we can do. We have to follow Wisconsin Open Meetings laws. We have to, we have to, we voluntarily abide by Robert's rules, but open meetings laws, we can't just decide to have, you know, an impromptu meeting in the hallway to talk about CWD. That, we're not allowed to do that. We have to follow statute, okay? Then some of the other things is that we're all voluntary, none of us are paid, and, and the, uh, the last thing is that we provide an opinion, we're advisory, but we have no power, I guess, is, is, the, is the best way to put it, okay? Next, we're gonna talk about our organizational structure. So to, to do this, what the statute allows us to do 
We created, uh, organized and governed by an established code of procedures and bylaws. These policies and procedures are intended to guide the operation and organization of the Wisconsin Conservation Congress. It is published for guidance of individual delegates to allow the orderly transaction of business and to ensure that all citizens of Wisconsin have an opportunity to be heard. This document, what you see here is just the upper portion of the first page. We have 20 full pages that guide us on everything we do, okay? Um, I'm not gonna read the fine print. Um, it's all on our website. If through any of this, if you wanna see our website, just go into the Wisconsin DNR website and scroll down. And one of the first things you'll see is you'll see the Natural Resources Board and you'll see the Wisconsin Conservation Congress. Click on that and just like everything else you do on the internet, it'll take you through the links to get to you to the different pages. Um, our structure starts with the public, okay? From the public, there are 72 counties in Wisconsin. The, the public elects five delegates from every county, 360 total delegates when we have a full, well, we have a full roster. Uh, right now with COVID, uh, there's been some challenges on that. But from those 360 delegates, you'll see on the, on the side it says advisory committees. There's, Typically 18 to as many as 25 advisory committees. Membership in the advisory committees can be as low as 10 and it can be as high as 30. It all depends on the timeliness of the subject, the intensity of the subject, uh, you know, how much of a hot button type thing it is. Uh, typically things like deer and elk, wolves, bear, there are always gonna be you know, 30, 30, 30 people in that committee and, and screaming for more. Whereas stuff that uh, maybe isn't um, uh, as hot button, something like motorized wreck vehicles or something, it, it might be a dozen people. But anyway, from the 360 delegates, we go through a process to select who will serve on those different committees and um, do the work of the Congress. After the 360, those 360 elect district leadership counselors for each individual district. We'll cover that in just a second. And from those 22 people, we'll then pare it down to five executive committee members. And the reason we have to have the second and third layer, the, the leadership council and, and the executive council is because bottom line, if we wanna react to things that are in the news, like PFAS as an example, it's difficult to do when you have to involve 360 people from 72 counties across the state. We found that we can be much quicker, more reactive if we have first the 22 leaders and from the 22 leaders then five executive people. The executive people can literally meet every 48 hours if we have to. We can post under Wisconsin Open Meetings Law and we can get together quickly and that's the purpose for the, the hierarchy. The, the District Leadership Council consists of 22 delegates, two from each of 11, 11 districts. Now the 11 districts, you say, well, what made you decide to draw the map where you did? Believe it or not, way back when, this is the way the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources had its districts laid out. So all we did was mirror exactly what they were doing. They've since changed, but at the time we looked at it, we didn't see any reason to change. But anyway, that's, that's where we came up with the way the districts are, are, are de, uh, delineated. So 11 districts, two delegates from each district are selected as a district counselor. District counselors then select the five members of the, of the executive uh, committee. Currently that would be myself and these other four individuals. Uh, in the middle is Joel Taylor, the vice chair. The gentleman in front of the flag is um, Dale Moss. He's the secretary. And then at, on the uh, lower level you have Terry Rarig and uh, Brett Weir. Those, those are the five. The five of us are the executive council currently. So we started again with the public. 
We selected 360, we elected 360. Those 360 then work with the Department of Natural Resources and, and the, the NRB. <clears throat> what is our role? Our role is to speak on behalf of the collective public input and to the NRB, DNR, and ultimately, uh, in many cases, the legislature. We study problems, we propose solutions to those problems, we participate in DNR committees. So we have our own deer and elk committee, but the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources also has a deer and elk committee. We participate in that as well, okay? Personally, I've, I've participated in the DNR's Northern Pike Committee. I've participated in the DNR's Elk Committee. Um, it, 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 it's fascinating work, uh, love to do it. Secondly, facilitate administrative rule process. <clears throat> there's, there's, there's a lot to creating a rule change in the state of Wisconsin. To do that, we help collect public opinion. We receive new rule proposals from the public. They're called resolutions. We'll talk about that. We conduct hearings to gather public input on proposals. One of the big ones we do that you've probably all heard of is our, it's called the spring hearing. It's in conjunction with the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. A good portion of the meeting is the department's. The rest of the meeting is, is the Congress's. <clears throat> so the annual DNR spring hearing and Conservation Congress county meetings, I guess I don't have to tell you that with COVID as a problem, the last couple of years, it's been a real challenge for us. We haven't been able to have the spring hearings because we haven't been able to meet in person. We've been able to do a lot of the work of the Congress and a lot of the work that we, we facilitate with the Department of Natural Resources, but it's been a, a little bit of a challenge because doing it all remotely, there are, there are things you gain, but there are things you lose by doing it remotely versus in person. We'll talk about that. You can see in the, the kind of the yellowish orange square, it says COVID changes. We've been forced to accept what's called a resolution online. Okay, no in-person meeting. Instead of gathering input from those resolutions and questions in a one, one evening meeting, uh, we've been doing it online and over the course of a 72 hour period. So if you read the fine print here, uh, it does say that the spring hearing typically would be, uh, that, well, it's the second Monday in April. This year, we're gonna, it's gonna start at 7 p.m. on April 14th and it will continue for 72 hours. So that, that's, that's something for, for those of you that want to participate, remember that date, okay? April 14th through April 17th. Um, that'll be part of the process this year. And you say to yourself, well, COVID is starting to drop off. Why, you know, that, this is in April. Why aren't you going back to the in-person thing? We had to make that decision the first week of January. And back in the first week of January, COVID looked a lot different than it does today. Uh, the reason we had to is the, the resolutions, the questions, both from the department and the Congress, they have to be printed. They're printed in a booklet. The booklets are distributed across the entire uh, state. Uh, every sports shop, retail store, et cetera, gets those booklets. So when we had to make the decision in January, in order to get the printing done and the distribution done, there just was no way we were gonna do this in person. In retrospect, we would have loved to have gone back and done it in person. Uh, annual DNR hearing, spring hearings and Conservation Congress county meetings. We do a couple of key things during that spring hearing as it's called. The first one is we elect those county delegates that we talked about before. Now we don't, we don't elect 360 people each and every year. The way it's set up, the way it's designed is we elect two of the five delegates each and every year in each county. Okay, it's a rotation. Uh, some people serve a three year term, some people serve a two year term, and that's how we're always doing that cycle. It's never good to completely wipe out uh, five delegates and have to rebuild. You lose too much talent, you lose too much experience, and that's why we do it in a, in a cycle. Uh, secondly, during that meeting, 
We review wildlife and fisheries department management rules. It's their portion of the meeting where they, any of the questions, et cetera, that they bring to the table, they, they discuss and input is gathered uh, in that portion of the meeting. And then the Conservation Congress also has advisory questions that we review in our, in our portion of the meeting. Followed by the last thing we do is we collect and discuss and provide input on citizen resolutions. So I'm gonna stop for just a second and let's, let's just talk about three key things. A resolution, a question, and then a, a, a proposed rulemaking, okay? First of all, by state law, the Department of Natural Resources can't do rules questions every year. They're only currently allowed to do it in odd numbered years, 2021, 2023, 2025, et cetera. So this year as an example, anything that they bring to the table is gonna be strictly and at an advisory capacity. It won't be a rules hearing, just an advisory. Okay, the Conservation Congress, we accept resolutions written by citizens each and every year. Those resolutions are, are reviewed and we work with the, the, the authors to make sure that they're in some kind of a usable format. We put them out there and you say to yourself, well, if we, if we get to go online and provide input, then why would we have to go in person? What you lose in this particular uh, situation is you, you lose the, the information sharing. You're not able to find out from the author what their intention was when they wrote the resolution. Without knowing what their intention was, you, don't, you have a hard time determining whether you're in favor or opposed to what they're proposing, okay? So there is something that's lost there. It makes it more convenient to go online you have a larger window of time that you can, you can deal with it, but it does make it more challenging because you don't know what the, the author was thinking. County delegate elections. We said that that was one of the first things we did and, and that is what we have sorely missed the last few years because, I didn't bump that, did I? Nope, okay. Because the election is how we fill our, our, our roster of delegates. Right now, we're about 30 to 35 delegates short. We're short because we've had people, unfortunately, pass away. We've had people that have relocated. And if you're no longer a resident of the county where you were elected, you can't continue to serve. Uh, we've had people that have taken promotions and moved out of state. So you understand that it can happen. The problem is that there's no good way to conduct an election on a statewide basis for the delegates of each county that exists. And we, again, we're a volunteer organization. We don't have a budget to do it with. And that's, that's the biggest holdback. We'd have to, there was a, a guess by one of the, the lawyers that it would take like a million dollars to put this thing together. We don't have it, so it, it's not possible. But anyway, what we're, okay. Squeezed it a little too hard, maybe? Okay. Uh, what we're doing right now is any citizen of the county who is at least 18 years of age and who is able to perform the responsibilities of a delegate is eligible to run for election. You must be a Wisconsin resident and a resident of the county that they are running in to guard against possible bias, conflict of interest, uh, et cetera. No fuller part-time uh, members of the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources or the Natural Resources board, board may serve, okay? What we are trying to do to help with the uh, vacancies, with the turnover that we have, is we are taking online applications for vacancies and uh, appointments will then be made from those applications by the county chairs that currently uh, uh, are responsible for their county or whatever. So voter eligibility is residents of the county in which they are voting. You have to be at least 18, age, 18 years old. COVID changes, again, no in-person meeting, no in-person elections, 
Delegates terms have been extended. So if you were on a two year term that was supposed to expire this year, we're extending your term one more year, confident that next year we'll be able to have full elections. From the DNR's part of it, uh, DNR wildlife and fisheries management related administrative rules hearing. That's what their portion of the meeting is called. It's in again, odd numbered years, proposed rule changes by the Department of Natural Resources, often WCC advisory questions from the previous year, rule change hearings to gauge public input on question, input is not binding. Once upon a time, we used to call it the spring hearing and you went to the spring hearing to vote, okay? We've changed the, the terminology because people would get confused. They thought that if they voted on a, a bag limit change for bass, as an example, that once they voted and once the, the, everything was tallied, boom, just like an election, it's over, it's done. And that's not the way it works. So we changed it from the word vote, we changed it to input so that we gave a truer representation of what it was. It's a, a gathering of public information, public input, and then that is shared with both the department, the Natural Resources Board, et cetera, as a recommendation. And of course, input is not binding, whereas a vote might be perceived as being binding. Some proposals will require legislative changes. So not everything that we talk about, not everything that we bring before the NRB is even within our purview. It may be covered by statute specific language and then it takes actual stack, statute, statutory changes by a legislator through the governor's office, et cetera, to change it. Introduce engaged opinion on new ideas or concepts to open the dialogue. That's all we're trying to do is get people talking. WCC advisory questions originate from citizen resolutions. So brand new ideas are called resolutions. They're discussed and advanced by advisory committees. So if, if, if someone in this room would write a resolution on changes to uh, deer hunting bag limits, as an example, it would go before the citizens of Portage County, but only the citizens of Portage County as a resolution. If the citizens of resolution thought it was a good idea, and provided a positive input, it would then go to a, the Conservation Congress Advisory Committee. In this particular instance, it would most likely go to the Deer and Elk Committee. They would study, weigh the benefits, the possible uh, challenges with such a, a change. They would make a recommendation to the District Leadership Council, the, the management level of the Congress, and then they would decide whether it should go back the next year as a full statewide question and be put out for the citizens of all 72 counties. If it then passed in all 72 counties, then it goes up the ladder to the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources and or the NRB and or the legislature, depending on, on what we're talking about. Those supported are advanced to the Natural Resources Board and ultimately the DNR for consideration. Some pro proposals will require legislative changes. Citizen resolutions. For a resolution to be accepted, all resolutions introduced must meet the following requirements. The concern must be of a statewide impact. The concern must be practical, achievable, and reasonable. The resolution must have a clear title and specifically define the concern. Current state statutes and laws must be considered with reasonable cause for change being presented. The resolution must clearly suggest a solution to the concern and a description of further action desired, okay? Citizen resolutions, only the resident individual author or designated representative in an, of an organization may present the resolution within the county. There has to be a, a Portage County resident must present resolutions in Portage County. Resolutions must be 2,000 characters or less exclusive of the title and author contact information. No more than two resolutions may be introduced by any person. Digitally submitted resolutions not meeting the criteria will not, not advance for consideration in the author's county. 
And a resolution must receive positive input. If it, if it doesn't get positive input from Portage County, then chances are it just, it, it, it dies for, you know, anywhere else it'd be, you'd say it died for lack of a second. Kind of a similar situation. It didn't get positive input, it just goes away. COVID changes again, electronic submission. This year's deadline was this last Friday. March 11th was the cutoff for this year for new resolutions. We, as of, as of uh, uh, Monday morning, we had 938 resolutions presented by March 11th. So uh, we, have a, we have a subcommittee, an ad hoc committee that will be extremely busy the next two weeks trying to ferret through all 938 resolutions that were submitted. Uh, large numbers of resolutions were submitted. Yes, they were. So this is going to be kind of a, a, a little graphic that kind of walks you through it. From citizen idea to administrative code. So you have the electronic submission at the very top in the center. If it receives positive input, it is forwarded to a WCC advisory committee. Again, like we talked, if it doesn't, it just kind of goes away. That WCC advisory committee then studies it, okay? Not every idea that a citizen comes up with will work, you know? I mean, uh, there, are, there are situations where maybe they're very, very locally specific. Maybe it makes sense to that individual, but in the bigger scheme of things, it just will not work. This is where the advisory committee works with it. We have de department staff that participate. Believe it or not, the 360 delegates are all across the board. We have all kinds of professionals from every walk of life, be it biologists, former department uh, people. They can't, they can't be on the Congress when they're active with the DNR, but if they retire, and we have a lot of those folks that have retired and are now part of the Congress. So we have a lot of expertise that come to our, our, our meetings that participate in, a, in an advisory capacity. We get a lot of information and that helps us work with these particular things. If an advisory committee decides that there is, there is not merit to the resolution, they can, they can disallow it and it just kind of goes away. If it is thought of by the advisory committee as a good idea, you can see that the next thing is it takes it to the district leadership council and the District Leadership Council also has a kick at the cat. They can discuss it. They, can, they have additional uh, department participation at that level. We can call in specific people and say, you know, this person would like to change uh, slot limits or, or whatever on walleyes on the Wisconsin River. What does the department see as the pluses and the minuses? Keep the, keep the discussion in the conservation, or the, um, the conservation, Conversation, the conversation going, okay? And then what would happen if it goes from a citizen resolution to a committee, from a committee to the district leadership, it then comes back the following April as a statewide question. We talked about that a little bit before. So then it starts again as, why did the? There was some animation that we had. Okay. No problem. Wow, I didn't even have to say all that. I could have just, I could have just I didn't killed it. Okay, did you guys want to go back and see the fancy animation? No, okay. Here, here's, a, here's, here's a list of the current advisory committees that we have formed within the Conservation Congress, okay? You can, you can tell there's some biggies there, bear, deer, Great Lakes, uh, legislative committee gets a lot of work. Um, rules and resolutions gets a lot of work. Uh, warm water, wolf. We also have the YCC Oversight Committee. We have a Youth Conservation Congress. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. So if, if a resolution goes to a committee, goes to the DLC, and the DLC puts it forward as a question, here's where we are. It comes back the following spring as a WCC question. If it if it's, receives positive input, 
it goes on to the Department of Natural Resources. If it doesn't, it goes away. Then the Department of Natural Resources puts it out as a question, if, and, and then they can provide input to the Natural Resources Board, both positive and negative, okay? Here's where it gets really crazy. This is the actual administrative rule process. These are all the steps that have to be, now, I made little cheat sheets in case somebody wanted to raise their hand and ask me what an LCRC is, because I wanted to know what the acronyms were. But they're buried in here, okay? And they're all legislative processes. Statement of scope is probably the biggest one you'll hear about. Probably, if any of you end up working for the Department of Natural Resources, statement of scope is prevalent in just about everything they do. Every time they want to ask for something or do something, somewhere along the line, there's a statement of scope. Um, but anyway, I wasn't going to go through all these. There's just no way. Um, it's a very complicated process, and that's why you know we, we try and gather as much input from citizens and the rest of it before we get to this level, because we kind of look at ourselves as kind of weeding out the chaff. You know, let's take an idea that maybe should never go forward, and let's let's get it out of there. If it's a really good idea, then maybe we should get it to this level because this is where it gets a little bit a little bit drawn out. Go ahead. What are those numbers on the chart to the right? Like one and a half, two, three. They're just steps in the process. Okay. Just steps in the process. It's, uh, that, that's all I can tell you is that okay. there, you, can, you can see that statement of scope, and then it goes scope is submitted and approved by the governor. Uh, scope. Yeah, I, I know exactly what you're saying. It's all just part of the process. I, I'm not sure why seven goes to seven and a half, why it has to be a half a point, I, I don't know. But it is part of the process on the way through. If it does, you know, if at any, any point in this whole thing, it's, it can be killed. Literally, one, one subcommittee or another. Approximate month? Okay, well that, okay. I didn't read that part of it, but it is, it is quite, a, quite a long process when you get to this. So anyway, um, let us work together and properly manage and wisely use our natural resources. Prologue of the Congress Creed. I'm not even sure where the creed is buried because uh, terminology changes. You have vision statements now. I think back then they had creeds. This is a picture, a slide of the uh, opening um, spot on our web page. This kind of gives you an idea what it looks like. A few years back, we also started what we call the Wisconsin Youth Conservation Congress. We wanted to get younger people more involved in the Congress, more involved in managing resources, more involved in, in uh, uh, decision-making process of, of, of the, the, not only the Congress, but the Department of Natural Resources. How did you say you do the, oh, there it is. So you'll see, you'll see Jessica right there. <laughs> she, is, she is one of the, she is a, a mentor for the Youth Conservation Congress. Jessica also got elected to the Conservation Congress here in Portage County. Her father might have something to do with that. Not the election. The encouragement. The encouragement. The, encouragement. the, uh, <laughs> the uh, <laughs> and here we have a third generation of our family that's involved in the Conservation Congress. If there's one thing I can tell you folks, and I was going to get to this and not just because of this, you folks got a big challenge as young people going forward. And it is not just your careers. It's not your careers. It's getting public involvement. Okay, you folks, if you're not already volunteering for something, find something that you like and volunteer. Because if you're not comfortable with being a volunteer, that tells me that the buck stops with you, that any kids you have also won't volunteer. It's something you learn as a young person. I hear in the news every day that snowmobile clubs are on the verge of Shutting it, shutting down because they don't have anybody to run the groomers. 
They don't have anybody to maintain the trails and put up the signs. There was a, one on channel, I think it's channel seven out of Wausau just this last week. There are fire departments that don't have people to volunteer in these small community volunteer fire departments. They are literally on the verge of going out of business because they don't have volunteers. So I don't care if it's you start out singing in the church choir. I don't care if it's you volunteer for the local boys and girls clubs. I don't care if it's you volunteer to be a local firefighter or if you volunteer to help out in the sport, uh, snowmobile trails. Volunteer for something. Your generation and the generation after you, it's going to be a really big issue. Okay? We are 100% volunteers. We saw enough of a need that we thought if we created the Youth Conservation Congress that we would get people thinking of that mindset, that like mindset. And also, a lot of these people are being encouraged to get into the type of careers that you folks have, have chosen. And that's why we created it. Okay, we see that as our future. Youth Conservation Congress's goal is effectively engage, educate, and involve youth in the management and protection of our natural resources and foster a conservation ethic through participation on the <coughs> Wisconsin Youth Conservation Congress. One of our objectives is to teach youth delegates about natural resources management and careers through a variety of service learning opportunities throughout the year and field days held across the state. That last slide you saw, here's, here's where they, they got to go to Hayward last year and do electrofishing, et cetera, et cetera, on the Namakagan River, all right? They've been down to do things with pheasants. They've banded ducks. They've, I would have I killed for this. <laughs> when I was young, you know. So again, this is what we've tried to do with our organization. But please, if you're not volunteering for something, find a way. The process by which Wisconsin's natural resource policy is determined, the role and history of the Wisconsin Conservation Congress, a statutorily created citizen advisory group. And that's all I have. So what questions do you have if any, about the process. Again, we start with, go ahead. If there's no questions, I'm gonna get out of soapbox. <laughs> okay. First off, I was a professor here at this university today, and the reason I'm here is I sent my son here back in the 90s in the state of Ohio. He was interested in natural resources. And I, I was fortunate to hear of this program. Uh, I'm a resident of Amherst, and it was published and publicized in my local paper. Now, getting back to the professors, if I was Christine Thomas of today, every one of these seats would be filled. Because if you were in my class, you had an A coming, oh, you didn't go. I was a B. I can't say enough, and I'm going to give you my name, Paul Chandler. I'm, uh, I'm the Wisconsin Wildlife Federation Board of Directors. Welcome. Uh, and I heard uh, uh, George Myers' famous statement of scope. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> I've heard that so many times. Anyway, uh, I, can't, I can't say more about how you summarized your presentation. Believe me, and I, I've seen this through my Lions Club, my local conservation club, and umpteen other activities. Nobody seems to care anymore for the younger generation. Oh, I'm too busy. Uh, I can't make a commitment because I might have something better come up next Tuesday. Put that aside. Dedicate yourself to something that concerns you and then follow through with it, and also encourage others to follow in your footsteps. That, that, I'm gonna get off the soapbox now, and, and just get on to uh, uh, a couple comments. Current, 
through your presentation. Yeah. Uh, the Wisconsin Wildlife Federation is uh, circulating a resolution countywide concerning, and I'm going to summarize it by saying, taking politics out of natural resources. Do you and think I that's believe, possible? I believe <laughs> there's going to be a resolution presented by each one of our members in the, uh, in the various counties. You can see that that appears as far as you... Uh, I, can, I, can oh. tell you, I can tell you that after talking with our DNR folks that have been reviewing those 900 resolutions, they're there. That is there, that, and that's good to hear. Uh, and the other element, uh, and excuse me, w one of the uh, key points of that resolution is to change what happened uh, and this is before I moved here 25, 30 years ago when the governor got to appoint the DNR executive director. Uh, the resolution asks that that uh, authority be returned to the Natural Resources Board. That has come up uh, many years, many times. Uh, hopefully, you, you younger folks in the audience here, some of this registers with you. If, if it doesn't now, you know, please look at the Conservation Congress uh, website or the Wisconsin uh, Wildlife Federation website, and, there, and you'll find information on this. Do I have anything else to say? Oh, one more, one more comment. Again, like I said, I, what needs to happen is this uh, deer farm or wildlife farm situation needs to be taken out of the hands of the Department of Agriculture, uh, Trade, and Consumer Protection. That authority should rest with the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. And, and that that goes straight to the legislature. That has, that has to go to the legislature. 100%. And, and let's uh, vote for those that might uh, take that out of the legislature. Well, the change would have to be made through the legislature is what I'm saying. So, it, do you guys have an idea what he's talking about there? How we currently select our, our uh, department secretary for the DNR versus what we used to do? Once upon a time, the Secretary Cole, you've heard that name. Secretary Cole's position used to be filled by the Natural Resources Board. They selected that individual. And then back, um, it was, Jim no, was it Jim Doyle? I thought it was before that. I thought it was uh, Tommy Thompson changed it to Jim, I think Jim Doyle had promised he was gonna change it and then he changed his mind. But I thought it was Tommy Thompson that actually changed it to being a governor appointed position. I could be wrong, but it, 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 we've been promised by several candidates and several governors that they were gonna change it back to the NRB, but that just never happened. So, other questions? Go ahead. Um, I have some questions about resolutions. Okay. It, it takes time, but just like every other, it depends on what you're asking. Something simple like uh, change a, a specific bag limit on a lake, you'd be surprised how fast that can happen. Changing something like um, uh, bag limits on, on bunnies or squirrels or something like that, it doesn't take very long. But if you're talking about changing something like uh, that is statutorily, locked in it takes it takes years it can take it can take three four five years sometimes i'm i'm currently as a as a volunteer again working with an, a group of people it's called uh, rawa recovering america's wildlife act we've been working on that for 20 years and we just it, we, we thought we we thought we really had it steamrolling this year you know we felt really good george myers one of the key people there as well. We thought we really had this thing steamrolling, but we're, we've been burned before, so we're skeptical, so we put it back on the ballot. 
for the spring hearing again this year for the simple reason that if all of a sudden it fumbles or stumbles in the legislature, we don't go back to zero. We still have that vote to call back on and get right back at it. So sometimes that was, that's what it takes. Sometimes you have to be persistent. If you see something that's wrong, and citizens get frustrated with that, they call and say, hey, I wrote a resolution three years ago, I wrote a resolution two years ago, I wrote a resolution last year, where is this going? That's just the way the world works. You know, sometimes to get it through, it takes legislation. If it takes legislation, it takes more steps, more hard work. Yeah, so I guess the question is, um, of the 900 whatever resolutions that you have this year, what would you say would be the number or the percent of those that would actually end up being a real change? Like, even if it takes a long time, like how, how many of them I, are... I don't know if I have anything that I can... I can refer to that would give me like a percentage of, of overall success type thing. Um, I know that if it gets through the Congress and if it gets through the advisory committees and it gets through the district leadership council, by that point we're feeling it's a pretty good idea and we'll keep doing everything we can to keep the process going. But going back to what we were talking about before, which way is the wind blowing in the legislature? has a whole lot to do with it. It really does. I mean, uh, in my personal opinion, there have, there's been some really good ideas that, that didn't turn out to be uh, very fruitful because they weren't you know, politically received well, is, is, is the best way I can put it. Um, and there's, there's two sides to every coin. And, uh, but that's, that's typically what it's all about in the end is politics. Other questions? Not a question, but just to, to follow up on your, uh, your, this, uh, your uh, covering of America's Wildlife Act. Yep. Something I, I found very interesting that I learned. It's one thing to pass the act. It's the second thing to get the funding for it. Correct. That's that's all. That's all part of it. That's all part of the process. So. Okay. Yes, sir. So if so many resolutions being submitted in like such a short amount of time, do you think that the decision-making process here in Wisconsin is like definitely supported by the members of the public? I think so. Do you think so? I think so. I think, I think our participation levels, well, some of it, you know, it, it, uh, I need a crystal ball to look at. But as an example, the very first year we were shut down in the spring hearing due to COVID, the numbers of people providing input went just unbelievably through the roof. Now there was all kinds of speculation about, you know, people were sitting at home, you know, they were laid off from work because of COVID. They didn't, they had lots of computer time under COVID, et cetera, et cetera. And that's what, what spiked it. But we were, we were at a level of, you know, getting like 5,000 inputs. That first year we shot up to 60,000 and then last year it dropped to 12,000. Well, 12,000 is still a pretty darn good kick. So we're pretty, we're pretty good with that. But it just shows you that people care and they do want to participate and they do want to feel like what they're doing can make a difference. So the challenge for us has been that it's, it, it, it's keeping up with technology and making technology work in you know, what we do. And it's, it's, it's a challenge because 360 delegates, 360 volunteers, pick 360 people in this building and tell me what the levels of competency might be on how to run a computer. <laughs> Try and sit in on some of these Zoom meetings when some of these delegates have never operated a computer in their life. Um, you know, I'm not saying that, it, that, that it's anything but what it should be. It's, it's citizens trying to do their best, and we should do our best to make sure that they can participate. And that's the important thing. So, Just a comment on that. The first year that it went by a computer, there was a great deal of fear that the antis would flood the internet and just create chaos relative to the uh, 
the process. Deducted, but that was not the case. It, it, it's not the case. And the other thing is, you saw all the steps that we go through. Well, there's a, there, I think historically back in 1934, there was a reason they put a lot of those steps in there. Is because it, it, it kind of check, counter check, balance, counterbalance, it still works. So, anything else? Yes, sir? I mean, this might be a little bit of speculation, but do you think that people actually think that there may be a difference when their resolution has to be through all these processes and they're going to be implemented and there's like seven members that are appointed by the governor? Well, not every resolution has to go that route, but yeah, they're. Well, uh, I guess as you get into the leadership level of the Congress, those are a lot of the questions and the emails and the phone calls that you deal with. What, what are you guys, you know, of course it's us. What are you guys doing? I had this great idea and it, it seems to have vanished. What are you doing about it? And, you know, we're all human. We just, we talk about it. I mean, that's, that's the one thing I think that still works for the Congress is the communication person to person. It's been a little bit of a challenge with this and, and you know, not being able to have in-person meetings and stuff. But I think, I think we're doing okay. Um, we've got some frustration out there because, again, uh, auditorium similarly sized to this one, multiplied times 72 counties, those spring hearings, there was a lot of chain exchange of, of information that was important, really was. And... Couldn't, couldn't fix that because of COVID, but it is something that, uh, oh, I can see I'm out of time. <laughs> but anyway, um, that was the, you know, that's one thing that we feel that we've lost right now. So now what we have to do is we've, we've, opened, we've opened Aladdin's lamp, and we've got these people that live in Douglas County, and they say, why the heck do I have to travel all the way to Stevens Point to participate in a meeting? when I can do it on my computer from home. And so now, as the Congress, we have to find a way to have the best of both worlds. We want the in-person, we want that involvement, but we also have to accommodate those people that live four hours away that, that just can't possibly drive down for an advisory committee meeting. So we'll continue to learn, we'll continue to grow, and we'll continue to work with it. Yes? I can't give you a quantity, I can't give you a number, but I can tell you that we get enough wins, often enough, that we, we stay fired up about it, okay? We get enough elk herds that are reintroduced, we get enough uh, um, American pine martens, we get enough 175 pound sturgeon harvested. I mean, talk about a success story. Look at that sturgeon management program and the fact that, you know, they, they harvest so many animals and yet the average size is getting bigger. Well, they're obviously not hurting, you know. So we get enough wins that that, that keeps us motivated. Okay? Yes? What was uh, the conversation with Congress like during the Wolf Pack conversation? What was it like? Yeah, I guess. Well, it, as you... It, 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 when it comes to a topic that is as polarizing as the wolf species is, it's always, always an interesting struggle. Because there's, I don't, you know, the, 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 the wolf is called the gray wolf, but there's nothing gray about the politics. It's black and it's white. You're on one side or the other. And what we try to do is we try and find people some common ground, but a lot of them don't want to find common ground. So it just goes with the territory. So anything else? Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me.